Okay, so thanks first of all for the invitation to speak um, tonight. It's a, it really is an honour to come and talk to you guys. This is such a great practice. I'm so excited for you that you're getting an MRI scanner. Um, we've had ours now for seven years or so. I think we're nudging to 4,000 scans and um, it's an excellent piece of kit. And Jonathan's already done a, a great talk on how as good as it is, we all need to work together to get the best out of it. Um, but we are in a position now where we couldn't live without it in the foot. It's, it's fast becoming the modality of choice for the fetlock, particularly in the thoroughbred racehorses. And there are a number of other areas as well where we found it um, extremely useful. But just for those um, of you that don't know where I'm from, I am from Rossdale's in Newmarket. I work at the Diagnostic Centre um, out at Exning. We're fortunate, as the guys are here, to have lots of different um, modalities available to us, CT and MRI. We came from a perspective of having MRI first and then CT second. I know that you're in the reverse position, um, and that may also influence a little how you use this uh, piece of equipment and what you use it for, and that may change slightly with time. But um, today I'm just going to talk for a little while about what we're trying to achieve. Case selection, I won't, um, I won't repeat too much of what Jonathan has already said. The technique that we use, that we find uh, to optimize the scanner um, down in Newmarket. Um, some thoughts on my clinical experience of what we've, uh, what we've seen over the years and as the cases have, have gone by and how we um, approach those cases now. I've also put in a few slides about what we've learned from MRI about radiography and that's quite important um, as far as the horses that don't get the chance to have an MRI scan it's nice to be able to use your knowledge of MRI to then look at your radiographs in what can be a, a completely different light and then just end on are we making any progress because that's really why we're why we're all putting these pieces of equipment in uh, hopefully but just to start with, well, what are we, we trying to achieve? And as Jonathan has said, there are lots of different groups of people here trying to achieve different things. Um, in the Really, the coal face of this is the MRI team, the guys in the room acquiring the scans. And what they really need are good images. They've got somebody breathing down their neck saying, we need to get these, uh, these images. And that, that's, it's good to put people in the room that really care about the images they're acquiring. They want to do it in a time efficient way. This is a difficult piece of equipment to use well. It takes time to learn how to use it. And then when you do use it well, and it's a busy system, if you're doing three a day, that's probably about two hours each. That's six hours of acquisitions um, and then all the reading as well. So we've, we've got to get something that we can use time effectively to make it um, something that we can incorporate into the day. It's also important, and I, I try and do this as best as we can in our department, is to keep the morale high within the people that are in that MRI room. As soon as it gets the mood starts to drop at the end of the day, it really does affect what they can achieve in there. So it's really important that we keep um, everybody um, knowing why we're in there, why we're trying to achieve what we're doing, um, and help them understand why it's worth those hours of work. There's also the referral clinician. And what we need, as far as looking at the images, are information that we can use to progress the case. And by that, really, we mean a diagnosis, a treatment plan, obviously, and then a prognosis. Moving on from there, we've got the referring vet. Um, so you guys that refer in to us. And I think what I found is that what you really need is to have diagnostic confidence in the piece of equipment, but also in the person that's giving you uh, the feedback from that as well. And it's, it's very important um, that that relationship is a good relationship. And that there is um, a difficulties arise really if, if you don't feel that we're giving you a good service or that you're getting good feedback on your cases. It's quite a um, can be a sensitive thing to give your case over to a referral hospital, um, and you know the relationship has to be a good one to make sure that that's a positive experience for everybody. You need the necessary information to communicate to your clients because they will often know you better than they know us. So sometimes, although they want to chat to us, we know all the nuances of what we've seen on the MRI, they're going to call you as soon as we put the phone down from them. So you need to know, and this is why I usually speak to the referring vet first before the owner, so that, um, so that you guys know and you're primed for when that call comes through saying, I don't understand what she's saying, can you explain it to me? So we need to be able to tell you um, in, in language that your clients can understand um, what's going on. You also need support if there are discrepancies, and there will be discrepancies. 
because of the nature of the way that we work and the, the way that we work cases up, sometimes people don't have the time to do all the intricacies of what is necessary. And sometimes horses come in for one thing and perhaps leave without an MRI or with another type of imaging modality um, being used pre preferentially. And what we need to do is explain to the clients why this is. And I've often found that when there are problems, it's when the communication breaks down and there becomes a, a problem between everybody not really understanding why the plan has changed. So that's super important in how we manage those cases. Now the horse owner, they want an answer. That's what they always say. I just want an answer. That's all I want. I want an answer. And what they really mean is a bit like, as we need, we want a specific diagnosis. So these horses may have been laying a while and they want to have an image of what that is and why that is and why the horse isn't coming right in many cases. They want an accurate prognosis. So the first thing they ask you is, well, will it be sound? Will it ever, do I need to put it down? When can I get back? Can I get to this competition on the 21st? All these types of things. And they want a treatment plan. So they, they want to see that you do something after the MRI. Um, sometimes it is all you can do is to make an image and then you know that's all that you can uh, afford that, that, that patient. But they often want you to say, well, what do we do next? And that's important. They also want efficiency. And it's very important to the clients that come to us that they often want to have the horse in and out. They perhaps don't understand, as we do, how complicated this procedure is. And so they often are sort of putting the pressure on you to get the horse in. Sometimes they want to sit and wait and then take it away. That can be done, but it's always the less satisfactory cases. Oftentimes these horses are at the, they've been lame for a long time, it's gotten complicated, there's often more than one vet involved before they get to us, the farriers have had a look at it, everybody's had a look at it, it's had acupuncture, everything. Um, so it's not a time to rush things and I do get try and get that message across to clients is that this is your chance now to get the answer so let's try and get it right and we need the time to do that. And again, they need confidence. When they arrive at a referral practice, they might be unfamiliar with the vets that work there. They might be unfamiliar with us and our working practices. And we need to give them confidence so that they feel that you've, you've put them in good hands, and that's very important. So the basis of a good outcome for everybody is that we have thoughtful case selection, which Jonathan's covered very, very well. A good MRI technique, it's not, as we've, I'm sure that you all know, it's, it's an excellent piece of equipment, but it needs to be used extremely well. We need a good interpretation, and that's, you know, we've gone past the stage now where we just look and see, has it got a deep flexor tail or not? We're past that stage now, that's sometimes what we're looking for. But there's a whole raft of things now that come into the interpretation, and we need to do that intelligently and logically um, because sometimes they get quite um, complicated results. We need to tease apart exactly what's going on. Then we need to have a logical plan to give them somewhere to go forward. And as I've said, excellent um, communication is involved at all these um, points. Now, despite doing all those things brilliantly well, um, there are still things, as Jonathan has said, that can confound as being able to, to um, take take the case forward with MRI, the size of the feet is actually very important. The, um, lots of the um, horses that we see will be the co larger cobby breeds, um, and it's not so much the size of the foot oftentimes, but the, actually the width of the, the size of the coronary band and the feathering around there. So sometimes you can't get the coil down far enough, and the foot size reduces the signal to noise ratio, so you get grainy images that perhaps you can't see all the subtle things that we try to look for these days. It's not impossible to scan those horses, but you can't be as, as you can't look as uh, in such detail as perhaps in other types of horses. The temperament of the horse has been covered. Um, for instance, we don't do hind limb fetlocks on yearlings or weanlings or things like that. That's a good way um, to kill yourself um, or the horse. In fact, um, the ability of the horse to stand still. People say to me, "Well, it's still fine for ultrasound," and it drives me crazy because <laughs> we're, you're literally thinking about millimeters of motion, and they have to be able to stand still for a really long period of time. And when they start fidgeting and moving, that really reduces the, uh, um, you know, the, the efficiency of the whole process. Um, time pressure again. Sometimes you are under time pressure, um, and that's what you've got to really try and keep um, keep everything together to make sure that the process still goes um, in a logical way. And then you can have technical issues. We have horses travelling sometimes six hours. They turn up. You go and start to calibrate the machine, and it might not work. It happens much less these days. I have to say, to quickly while well, Nick's there, um, hardly ever in fact. Um, but just occasionally, a horse may stand on the coil, for example, um, and then if you've got a broken coil, you can't persist. So there are things that go against even with the best of intentions.